Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Asking me to do this. Um... Some days I said thank you, and some days I did not. Um, I would also like to welcome the newcomers. Um, I felt that pain of the two days. I I felt that way. I felt that so hard. So I think everybody in the room did. So thank you for your bravery for standing up and being here tonight. Um, okay, I got so. Oh, and um, welcome to all the rest of the newcomers. Um, I got sober and. In September 30th, 1990. So um, that's... Somebody has to do hard math. That's 32 years. Um, And um, I always like to say I got sober in the 1900s. Um, (laughs) And I say what it was like. Oh, I grew up in a home of alcoholics. I was born into a family of alcoholics. Um, I was the youngest of five children. There were seven of us in the family, and five of us are alcoholics. I am the only one who, though, made it to Alcoholics Anonymous and stayed. My father did come to Alcoholics Anonymous, but he did not stay. Um, I had an uncle who died of cirrhosis of the liver. Um, My grandfather, I don't... I. This thing is a little sensitive. Um, My grandfather, um, I always say he did die of alcoholism, even though it was a really strange death. He was put into a home, like a a board and care home, or just a boarding home, um, after my grandmother died. And they weren't allowed to drink, so he would sneak bottles in, and when they were empty, he would go and throw them into the garbage, but it was... There was like a little edge cliff thing that he had to throw it over. And one day he didn't let go. And he landed on his head and he died. And so that is a direct um, result of alcoholism. Um, I had a great-grandfather. According to our family history, we have quite a colorful one, as you can imagine, um, that they used to lock in the attic whenever there was an event that alcohol was going to be served. So we are very lucky that we do not have to be locked in attics today. Um, You know, that's where they came from when Alcoholics Anonymous was not available. Um, So I grew up in a house where the isms were alive and well and functioning, okay? So not only do I believe that I was alcoholic from the get-go, I was given the tools of alcoholism. And when I was... Six months old, I used to think this story was funny, and I don't anymore. Um, I was six months old. I couldn't sleep, and I was crying, crying, crying. So one of the neighbors said, put a little wine in her bottle. So they did. Um, when I was two years old, I was told I was, we were, my parents were having a cocktail party, and I went around and took sips off of drinks until I passed out. Um, I do recall at five that my uncle and my father had made some homemade beer, and it didn't turn out, so it didn't have any fuzz to it, so they didn't think it had had any alcohol in it, so they gave it to us kids. (laughs) There's so many things wrong with that. I mean, it could have killed us because it didn't turn out, but anyway. And I remember taking a sip of that and thinking it tasted terrible. Um, Though, when I was 10 years old, I walked into the kitchen, and my uncle and my father were drinking, and it was midday, and they offered me a beer. And I remember thinking that was really cool, and I also remember taking that first drink off that particular beer. Now, I had drank many times other, you know, we were always given little sips and stuff along the way, but that particular moment was when I took that drink that I realized this was the solution to all of my problems. And I started chasing that at 10 years old. Every chance I got, every babysitting job I had, I drank any time I could. Um, Fast forward to the teenage years. I never made it into one dance except my two prompts. Every dance I ever went to, I never made it out of the parking lot because we were always out in the parking lot drinking. Um, Every football game, I stayed out in the parking lot and drank. 
Um, I just, alcohol was more important than any other experience in, in life as far as I was concerned. I totally lost my train of thought already. I'm not good with microphones. Um, so anyway, at about 16 or 17, my mother diagnosed me as an alcoholic. She was a great Al-Anon, and she said, you drink just like your father. I mean, I don't know what she was talking about. I was getting drunk and wetting the bed at 16, but, you know, I didn't think that was a problem. Uh, but she did. So she let me know that I, I was probably alcoholic, and then I spent that time until I got sober at 29 trying to not be an alcoholic. I had all these rules around drinking. I wasn't going to do this. I wasn't going to do that. There were just, and I broke every one of them. Um, I remember I lived in an apartment by myself, and my thing was I I had a rule that I didn't, wouldn't drink by myself until I lived by myself, because then I'm like, heck, you know, I can't not drink when I'm home. Um, So... (laughs) One night, um, I was looking for my cat, and I went out in the on my back patio, and I looked over, and there was this breezeway, and there was this fence, and I was looking over the top of the fence, looking for my cat, and I saw, I thought, it looked like a pile of clothes, and I was like, what is that? And then I realized it was a person, and of course, I'm drunk, drinking by myself, and I say, hello, <laughs> or it dawns on me it was a peeping Tom. Yeah. And so then I ran back into the apartment and I locked the door and I called the apartment manager and he came over and he checked the area out for me and everything. And so when it was all settled and done, this is how my mind worked. I'm like, wow, the peeping Tom probably saw me drinking by myself. Does he think I'm an alcoholic? (laughs) No. Um, Those were the games I played with my alcoholism. Um, I stopped... Drinking and driving too drunk when I left a bar where I had drank as much as the guys that I was with, and we went parted ways, and one went one way, and I went another way, and he got a DUI, and I didn't. So then I got scared, and I thought, okay, I got to stay home. I can go out and have two drinks, and then I got to go home. And then I had another rule. <laughs> I had so many rules. Um, that I couldn't go to the same liquor store twice, every day. I could only go every two days. But I couldn't go to another liquor store either, but whatever. So I would buy a half a case of beer, and I had a six beer minimum at home. Now, if I went out and came home, I still got to drink six more beers, right? So that was not really working either. And I'm sure those those people at the liquor store knew I had a problem, um, even though I was only there every other day. Um, kind of fast forward to, I don't have a lot of drunk log. Most of it I try not to remember, but I mean, every once in a while I do think of, I mean, I lived in, before I moved to Fresno, I lived in Spokane, Washington, which is like 20 minutes away from the Idaho state line. And in Washington, it was 21 to drink. In Idaho, it was 19. So we would get in the car, load everybody in the car. It didn't matter, rain, snow, ice, sleet. And we'd drive that 20 minutes on the freeway. And and we didn't have designated drivers. You could still get out of a DUI for 100 bucks. Um, So anyway, I get the chills sometimes at night when I think about those moments and those things that we did. But, you know, my drunk log is not that great, so I'm going to move on. What happened? The day that I hit bottom, I spent, it was a beautiful September day, and I only know that because everybody that came into the bar at TJ Fridays asked us why we were sitting in the bar on such a beautiful day. (laughs) Um, Because on a Sunday, my favorite thing to do was sit in a dark bar and drink all day. So my friend Jeff and I were drinking Long Island iced teas, which, by the way, I was well sober before I realized that that's two and a half drinks, really. I did not know that. And then after you drink one or two, they taste like Kool-Aid. So, yeah, it was trouble. Um, So we drank quite a few, and he took me home, and I had my six beers at home. (laughs) So I started drinking my beers, and I remember I wanted to watch this show, um, 
now I can't remember the actress's name, but her family, it was all going to be about her alcohol, her alcoholic family. Right. So I'm like, okay, I can relate to that. My alcoholic family is always the problem. Right. And so I'm watching the show drinking. I don't know how many more beers I drink after drinking all day, um, Long Island iced teas. Um, and I'm watching the show and I'm relating to the actress as, you know, she's got this terrible family that all drinks and she's not a drinker. And her sister comes into this one scene and she holds up a chip and she says, I got 30 days today. And there was this little voice inside of me that says, I want that. Now, I can guarantee you the last place on earth I wanted to come is AA. My dad went to AA. It was all old, crazy, drunk people. I don't know. But anyway, I did not want to go to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, that was not going to be an option for me. Um, and so that was just weird that I would have that sensation. The movie ends. I get up to go to the bathroom to get ready to go to bed, and I cannot walk into the bathroom because I could not look myself in the mirror one more time in that condition. And so I didn't know what to do. I started to panic. And I had worked with this guy named Bob R. I know his last name, but I'm going to say Bob R. Anyway, if you listen to Sobercast, he's the introduction to Sobercast. Um, anyway, he, I worked with him, and he was very outspoken about being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and being a sober um, person. And we had oddly created a friendship, even though I was trying really hard not to be an alcoholic. I made friends with this, this recovering alcoholic. And so I called him and I was, he answers the phone. And I'm like, he's like, hello. And I'm like, hi, what you doing? I'm like, I'm fine. I was not fine. Um, and he said, I'm on a date. And I said, oh shoot. I said, okay. Um, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And he said, okay. And so I hang up the phone and I try to go back to the bathroom and I still can't go to the bathroom. And if I can't go to the bathroom, I can't go to bed. So I'm like walking, literally pacing this three feet from my living room to my bathroom back and forth. And then I, I start to cry. And then I think, well, get a piece of note paper and write yourself a note tomorrow. <laughs> get help in the morning. Um, and, but there was a part of me knew that that just wasn't going to happen. So I called him back. I'm ruining his date, but I'm, I'm hysterical now. I'm sobbing so uncontrollably. And he answers the phone and I said, I'm just sobbing so hard. I, all I can get out is I need help. And because he was a member of Alcoholics Anonymous and he was taught to show up, he dropped his date and drove to my house at like 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. After I got off the phone and I knew he was coming, I was like, I better clean up. Like, there's beer cans everywhere. Like, I don't want to look bad. So I'm cleaning up, and I'm getting everything out of there. That always kind of cracks me up. And so he shows up, and I open the door, and I'm sobbing uncontrollably. I'm like, I need to go to AA. And he starts laughing. <laughs> and I had some choice words about that. You know, I'm like, screw you. This is not funny. There's nothing funny about this. Oh, he was elated. He's like, I thought you got raped or something. You know, he was, he did not know what was going on. So he was all excited. And um, I was not. And we sat on the couch and talked for a while. And he left. And I'm pretty darn sure I had alcohol poisoning that night because I vomited all night long, because um, I have no idea how much I drank. And I remember him saying to me, he goes, did it just quit working for you? And I'm like, no, I'm still drunk. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you talking about? But now I know it had quit working for me. I could not drink enough to stop thinking about it, to stop thinking about the fact that I knew I was an alcoholic to stop thinking about whatever it was that I, I just couldn't drink enough. And I had really tried that day and I was still too coherent for my, my, my taste. So he took me to a meeting. My first meeting, um, I did not introduce myself as a newcomer because he didn't tell me the rules. And so, cause I would have followed them. Um, and I just sat there. I couldn't look up. I couldn't speak. I couldn't think, I, I, you know, but I do remember thinking it was, 
really bright in there, and everybody was really happy. And um, I do remember meeting, <laughs> some of you know this person, I remember meeting Tom on my first, um, in my first meeting, um, and that'll come later, but some of you do know who he is. And I remember just thinking him and a few other people were just like, they just seem so normal, you know? And um, so shortly after that, I got a sponsor. Um, I started working the steps. Um, I vowed to to not date for a year because I was pretty sure men were a problem and that that would get me into trouble. Um, I made a lot of really great friends and we had so much fun. That first year I had so much fun. I worked the steps. I was scared. I can remember more than once coming home from work, like quite frequently coming home from work after spending the whole day saying, you know what? I'm never going to drink again. I'm going to throw up. I'm going to drink. You know, I was a puker. So I was constant. Like I was sick all day. And then I would be in at my kitchen table. I was in sales doing paperwork, drinking a beer. And I don't even remember getting it out of the refrigerator. So I was afraid. I was really afraid to drink again. Once I walked through the doors of Alcoholics Anonymous. So got the sponsor, worked the steps, got involved, um, overly involved sometimes, you know, uh, but got involved and made a my life. Um, after I got a year, a little bit after that, um, that Tom asked me out <laughs> and um, we started dating and then we moved in together and it wasn't going really well. I think he could even admit that. It wasn't going really well, so he suggested that we get married, and I agreed. <laughs> yeah. And I agreed, so we did. And we both really, really wanted to have a child because we were a little bit older, and um, so I got pregnant right away, which was the best thing that could ever happen. And the best thing that's ever come out of my sobriety. Um, I love my daughter so very much. Um, <laughs> so anyway, we got married. Um, we had a baby. Um, and I've heard this before. I got a life. You know, AA gave me a life. And I stopped going to meetings. And I stopped participating. And I stopped working the steps. And um, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Anyway, um, that marriage did not work out. Um, we're very good friends today, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, we have a wonderful daughter who we love very much. Um, and I just, like I said, it's the best thing that happened to me in my sobriety. When we, um, when we divorced, I was mad at God, but, but I could tell God that. I could tell God I was pissed. It was okay. My God could take that. Um, but I was pissed at AA because I thought AA didn't work. And as I've come to learn over the years, and, and I, I see this in people sometimes besides myself, AA doesn't work. You have to work AA. And I wasn't working it. But I turned my back on Alcoholics Anonymous, got a life. I did go to church, so I did have a God in my life, and I think that's what kept me from drinking. And I spent the next, I don't know, a few years, probably more than I'm willing to admit, but um, as a dry drunk and creating a lot of wreckage. Um, I would go to one meeting a week, um, and if I something happened that night, I wouldn't go to that meeting. I would just not go for two weeks. Um, and again, I was a dry drunk. And there was one night on a Friday night that I went to a sales meeting. And I was feeling very particularly sorry for myself and, and deep, deep self-pity. Um, and in that meeting, I decided that I would go home, drive in the garage, close the garage door, and leave the car running. And that was like on a loop in my head. It just went around and around and around. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden... One of my coworkers, who I love, sat down to me, sat down next to me, and she said, my husband told me he wants a divorce. And it popped me out of that loop long enough to say, let's go to coffee after the sales meeting. And so we went out to 
coffee and I listened to her and I talked to her because Alcoholics Anonymous taught me to be that way, to, to engage with people and help people. And when I got in the car to drive home, I didn't want to kill myself anymore, you know. And that still wasn't enough to wake me up to get me back to meetings and back to work in the steps, unfortunately. What did get me back to work in the steps was a few years after that, I left a doctor's office. Thank goodness it was on Thursday because I went to that one meeting a week on Thursdays. Okay, so thank goodness it was on a Thursday. And he had told me I needed half, to, half my thyroid removed. And I was so excited. I was like, ooh, I get to be put out. And I'm going to tell you, when I was drinking, that's all I ever wanted. I did not want to party and have a good time. I wanted to be put out. I wanted to go to sleep. Um, so I was really excited. And then I'm like, they'll probably give me some pain pills, too, you know. And so I go, I'm, I'm this way, all the way to the meeting, you know. And I get into the meeting, and the meeting starts. And all of a sudden, I realize that that should scare me a lot, like a whole lot. And I got really scared. And they called on me, and I, I shared, I'm really scared. Um, that day, I got a new sponsor. Um, I'd actually been sponsor less, so let's not pretend there was another sponsor in there. Okay, so <laughs> I'd been sponsor less. You can't, you can't lie up here, you know? You can, but I, I can't. Um, <laughs> So I got a sponsor, and she had a workbook that she liked to work, and um, she said, we'll start with this workbook with step one. And I said, oh, can we just do a step four? I just really think I need to do a step four. And she's like, we will do step one. And I'm like, okay. Um, so I obeyed. Um, and the surgery kept getting postponed. And it got postponed long enough for me to get back into the rooms, get to more meetings, work the steps, and um, I could have that surgery, and it was miserable. The anesthesia made me sick. I mean, I have, I have a slit in my throat, and I'm throwing up, and they're telling me I can't throw up, and I'm like, yes, but I am. Um, it was not fun. There was nothing fun about it, okay? The, the pain medication that I was taking made me sick, everything. But that all made me sick, yet I left that bottle of pain medicine on the counter. Just left it there, like making it part of my home. Diane used to say, my sponsor at that time used to say, you know, lions come in and they make everybody feel like it's relaxed and everything's okay and they're not going to attack anything. And then they wait around for a while and then they pounce. And I feel like that was the lion sitting in my kitchen. Um, and then I'm in the kitchen one day cooking dinner and my adorable daughter who's in third grade comes in and she, she's got enough AA under her belt that she says to me, when are you going to flush that? <laughs> I'm like, and then I looked at her and scolded her and I'm like, mind your own business. And it shocked me. And I went, oh my gosh, I was like keeping that for what? And so I went, don't tell me after the meeting I shouldn't flush medication because I don't do that anymore, but back then we did, okay? But I don't do that anymore. Um, so anyway, that's what woke me up to get me back in the rooms. And I've, I've been to and seen a lot of people not make it back into the rooms after they've um, slipped on medication. So I know this is an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, but to me that was the thing that really woke, really woke me up. Um, let's see, I have a few stories that I like to tell. I just write down words. So, um, I'm going to back up a little bit to when I was six months sober, I turned 30 and I had planned, you know, when I turned 30, I would have a big party. Right. And I woke up that morning and I was pissed at God. I'm like, why did I have to get sober before my 30th <laughs> birthday? So I got in the car. I was in sales. I spent a lot of time by myself. Not good. Um, and all the way to Hanford, just this repeats going on in my head. Like, this is unfair. I don't like it. I don't want to do it anymore. Um, and so 
Back then, we did have cell phones. We didn't use them very often. I didn't have the number for central office. I knew I needed a meeting, but I just didn't know how I would get that done. So I'm driving down the street in Hanford that I have driven up and down since I'd been sober for six months at least three times a week. And I look over, and I see that beautiful blue circle with the diamond in it and the AA in a window. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go back there at noon and see if they have a meeting, you know? So I do my sales. I go back there to the noon meeting, and they called on me. Um, and I started crying. And I said, I'm 30 today. Drink. Um, and I will never forget the lady that shared after me. And I know, I mean, I got six months of this one day at a time stuff, right? But she looked me right in the face, and she said, you don't have to drink today. And for some reason, that was like, okay. <laughs> sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Um, but it made quite an impression, and I've been able to continue to do that for some time now. Um, so that was one of those early on miracles of, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous is always there for us when we need it. This is, I'll give you a little teaser on this. Um, I wrote down TP and vodka, okay? <laughs> That's all I have written here. Um, my mother, in 2019, my mother were very close, and in 2019, at the, on Christmas Eve, she had to go to the hospital, and it was just this downward spiral, right? And we had to remove her out of her home and put her into a, a care place, or it was just a boarding place till she could get into a care home. And... Um, my sister didn't live here, doesn't live here, and so it was just me. And then there was, the pandemic started to be a thing, you know? So one day I woke up and I, I said to Alan, I said, um, we need to go to Costco today. And he goes, we don't go to Costco till Friday. I'm like, we're going today, okay? So we went to Costco and it was just starting to get a little crazy, not yet as nuts as it got. And I, I told him to go get some toilet paper. And so he went over there, and it was a little chaotic over there, right? And it said, you can only buy two. So he grabbed two. And so he brought, him, brought it over. I'm like, we don't need this much toilet paper. He goes, it said you could only have two. We better get it. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we take it home. And um, then I found some in my mom's garage. She had a whole thing, Costco toilet paper. So now we got three, right? And then you know what hit the fan, and there's toilet papers out all over town, right? And I'm feeling guilty that we have all this toilet paper. I'm offering it to the neighbors. I'm telling my coworkers, do you need toilet paper? Let me know. <laughs> One night I come home from work, and I count it. <laughs> we had 96 rolls of toilet paper in our house. Okay. I know, nuts, right? So I go, and, and this whole time, it's not about the toilet paper. It's about my poor mother. But um, I go over the next weekend to my mom's house, and I'm cleaning it out, and I'm finding rolls of um, oh, paper towels. And I'm like, oh. so I'm putting those in a bag, and then I go in the bathroom, and I open a cupboard, and there's more toilet paper. <laughs> So now I'm really upset. And so I put that in the bag, and then I open another cupboard, and there's more toilet paper. And I'm like, I just can't even handle this anymore, right? And I'm really kind of crazy about it. I don't know if that ever happens to any of you. I open the third cupboard, and to my surprise, there is a half a bottle of vodka in the bathroom. And I'm like, my mom was not a drinker. I, the only thing I can think of is there was the caregiver was drinking, and I would too, um, if I had to do that. <laughs> If you are a caregiver, you have all my admiration. Um, so I, I'm so scared. I cannot tell you how. I, I have like 28 years or 29 years of sobriety. And I am terrified. And I don't know what to do because I'm so afraid if I open it, I'm going to drink it. I don't know. It just seemed like that was going to happen. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, it just seemed like it was that was going to happen. So I called my husband, and I'm like, you know what? I'm really scared. I need to pour out this vodka. He's like, do you want me to come over? I go, no. So I, op I just wire on the phone. I open it, and I pour it out, right? Okay. Crisis alerted for that moment. Then when it's time to leave, I have literally this big, huge trash bag 
full of paper towels and toilet paper. I'm going to be pissed off, right? I'm grumbling as I'm walking out to the car. I don't know why I couldn't be grateful. Everybody else would have been. Um, but so I'm walking out to the car, and I'm, I'm pissed. And I see this guy who's just got the cans out of the dumpster walking by, right? And I'm like, hey, do you want this? And he said, sure. So he comes over and he gets it from me. He's like, this is heavy. <laughs> like, what the hell is this lady? And um, he opens it up and he looks at it and his face lit up like a Christmas tree. And I was, he was like, thank you so much. And I said, no, thank you. It just brought me to that gratitude that I needed. I was missing. And, and God provided him to provide something to me that I couldn't get without that. So, and I'm going to promise you that when I said, do you want this? That was not me. That was God, because it just came out my mouth before I even knew what I was saying. Um, anyway, so gratitude. My mom ended up, um, having a stroke in just in September of 2021. And she was put on, I, I had to put her on hospice and that's not fun if you've ever done that. Um, she was unable to talk and she was unable to walk or move and we didn't think it was going to be very long. So I went every day, every day, every day. And she wasn't, she was staying, staying, staying alive. Um, and then she started getting a little better and so, okay, but okay. So anyway, fast forward to almost a year later, she's still alive, um, I go to visit her one day, and I can tell that now the end is near. I, she's, she's got all the signs that I've been reading about in the book. And um, so I go through that whole process of regrieving her, like I'm, I'm, this is the final time. And so eight days into that, because she had stopped eating and drinking, which would have been three days, should have been three days, but okay, eight days later... Um, <laughs> Actually, it was about three days or four days in, and I woke up one Saturday morning, and Ellen was gone to a meeting, um, and I it was the first time in that entire year and in that entire time that I've taken care of my mother that I felt so alone. Like, I felt so alone, I started crying. And... I usually don't do that. I usually always can find God in something, but I just couldn't do it that day. So I got in the car and I drove out there and let me tell you all the way out there, I just was crying and I wanted to throw up and I just didn't want to do it. I did not want to do it one more time. It was just too hard. And I went into Sear and when I left, there was a gal that I kind of gotten to know at the front desk and she goes, can I walk you outside? And I said, sure. And she goes, um, I'm an empath, and I just need to tell you, you're not alone. And I just felt like God came right down and just said what I needed to hear. And just that moment, it all just was okay. Um, it took my mom 11 days to pass away. I had to stop going after eight because it was too hard. And... Um, I'm the kind of person who shows up for all of that. I never shy away from it. I don't know if she needed that in order to go, but I did on the eighth day, I whispered in her ear and I said, I love you. I'm not coming back. Um, I don't know why I wasn't supposed to be there with her when she passed away, but I wasn't. Um, anyway, let's do a lighter note thing. So... 15 years ago, I went to a party at Meg's house, and she introduced me to this man named Alan, and um, we now have been together for 15 and a half years and um, married for 11, so it hasn't always been easy. Um, I would never pretend it was, um, but it's been great. Um, and a couple summers ago, we went to Boston. Well, we went to Canada and then we went to Boston. So we had been gone traveling for a week. It was hot. It was humid. <laughs> um, we hadn't been to a meeting for a week, which that's too long for both of us 
individually, let alone to be together. Um, <laughs> so it was Friday night, and we decided we needed to go to a meeting. So we um, went to dinner, and Alan wanted to call an Uber, and I didn't, because I didn't want to get to the meeting too early. So I was like, no, nah, I don't want to talk to people. Um, <laughs> I just want a meeting. So I said, let's walk. And so we had the GPS going, and we kept getting to this one intersection, and it would say, you're two minutes away, and then we'd be three minutes away. And now we do this like four or five times, right? Now we really need a meeting. We're barely speaking. Um, it's not pretty. So we get to the meeting place. We finally find it in this really strange little side street. And we walk up. The lights are on. There's people in there. We go to open the door, and it's locked. And so we're like, and they look at us, and they look away. I know. We're like, wait, what? <laughs> it's Boston. Maybe they're not nice. I don't know. Um, but then they look back at us because we're not leaving. <laughs> And then they're, like, drawing straws on who's going to go talk to us, right? Well, come to find out it wasn't an AA meeting. It was a business, and they thought, what are we doing there on a Friday night? But um, so they're like, yeah, there's no AA meeting here. So we're like, oh, no. So we walk down, and I sat down on the steps, and I just started praying. I'm like, God, I mean, I don't even know. It's 7 o'clock. How are we going to find another meeting? How are we going to get there? I don't know. God, please help us. And Alan's furiously looking, and these two young men walk up, and they ask him a question. We're like, we're lost. And then they walk off, and then they walk back. And Alan hears him say something about an AA meeting. So they were looking for a meeting. And so they, we said, yeah, it's not here. It's closed. And the guy said that's a lot of that's happened since COVID. A lot of the meetings haven't opened back up. So I'm like, oh, we are in real trouble. But then at two seconds later, I threw my hands up and I said, two or more are gathered. Let's go have a meeting. So we went down to this little intersection where there was these planters that we could sit on. And I mean, people are walking by. There's like a little dog place and they're walking their dogs around and we're, we're going to have a meeting, right? And so I'm like, we quickly introduce ourselves to each other. We start the meeting with the serenity prayer. We go around and share just like we would. Alan read the preamble, you know, all of that. And as we were sitting there, I was like, wow, this must have been what it was like for Bill and Bob. When this is all you have are two people, you know, besides the two of us. And I was just overwhelmed by it. And then I thought, oh, what if our GPS hadn't screwed with us like that? We would have gotten there early and we would have left. So after the meeting was over, I told those guys that, and they were like, wow, yeah, that's crazy. I go, yeah, that's God. And the one kid goes, are all AA meetings like this? <laughs> he had never been to a meeting before. That was his first meeting. Yeah, yeah. So the other one who had about nine months of sobriety, he goes, will you sign my court card? <laughs> I refrain from telling him he could sign it himself, but um, <laughs> so I was pulling it out and I said, oh, it's asking for a meeting name. What should we call the meeting? And he said, we should call it God's meeting. Yeah. And then they said, can we take a selfie? Because nobody's going to believe that we ran into these old, two old people in, on the streets of Boston and had an AA meeting. <laughs> Anyway, it's time to wrap it up. I am so grateful for all of you that came out tonight. Thank you so much, Jose. Alcoholics Anonymous is the best thing that ever happened to me in my entire life. Um, I've had, there's a lot more to my story than, than what I was able to share tonight that was, has been difficult to overcome, but none of it has had to be done alone. So thank you so much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.